Okay, apparently I'm live. Hello, you groovy people. Hope everybody, everything's good. So today I'm in the arena. I want to talk about spooking. I had a little request in one of yesterday, the day before yesterday's uh, broadcasts, that somebody would like me to talk a little bit more about spooking. So I'm just seeing, I'm just having a little experiment. If any of you do social media in the same way that I do, you might be able to help me out here. Just seeing if I can get the live broadcast on my other phone so that I can read the comments more easily or if there's a way to do that. I'd really like to know if there is. There we are. I'm trying to have a look, see if I can see any comments. So first of all, I'm going to need some comments. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, hi. How are you doing? Um, no, that doesn't seem to be operating. So we'll turn that turn that one off. Oh, it was a good idea, wasn't it? I'd like to be able to read the comments without having to squint at the screen. So I'm on my mobile phone, um, which obviously is a, a less satisfactory than my usual setup of a laptop and independent camera, but that's because I wanted to come into the arena to chat about spooking horses. So spooks, how to cope with spooks, what we do to train ourselves to cope with spooks, because, uh, oh, look, those people have suddenly appeared. Hello, Leslie. Hello, Stacy. Jill, thank you very much for joining. So what we're going to do about spooking horses, most people go out hoping the horse won't spook when the horse does spook there isn't a plan in place there um nobody knows what to do we get brain freeze have we all heard the term brain freeze I assume we've all heard the term brain freeze so what there's a little blue thumb somewhere so tap the blue thumb if, if you use that phrase brain freeze so the way it goes is the horse spooks the brain freeze comes in and you don't do what's necessary. When the spook's over, you then proceed and hope it doesn't happen again. It's not really satisfactory. It's not really preparing you or the horse for life out there. So I've got a phrase that you might have heard me use before. What does a horse do when A, B or C happens? What does the stallion do when it sees a mare? What it's bloody told. Ooh swore but there you are that's how much i believe it <laughs> what does the horse do when it spooks or anything what it's told without swearing so what it's told has two there's, there's actually two parts to that little phrase i've mentioned this before maybe you know it already what does the horse do when it spooks what it's told this implies a that the horse can continue to receive instruction and we should expect the horse to continue to be well-mannered, well-behaved, well-trained to get the result. Quite a lot of people don't even go that far. They don't go that far. They, um, they start making excuses for the horse. Well, you can't blame it really. It was a very big plastic bag. Or you can't blame it. Oh, well, the horse has always been frightened of A, B or C or the lorry, the lorry hit its brakes and the air hissed out or whatever it is. Always some excuse why the horse didn't do as it was supposed to do. Is this sounding familiar at all, anybody? <laughs> um, so it's actually quite important that in all circumstances, we should expect the horse to receive instruction and still do what's required of it in order to get A, B or C, go to A, B or C or whatever. The second part of that little phrase, what does a horse do when um, something goes bang? What does a horse do when a branch falls? What does a horse do when a pheasant jumps out? What it's told has the second implication for you and your, where's my camera? Your responsibility <laughs> um, that you have to tell the horse something. You have to tell the horse. It's you, it's down to you. This is your responsibility that when the spook happens, the horse does what it's told. And that's you. You have to tell the horse that. Then a lot of finger pointing. It's quite like that. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, we do. We do. We've got as I, I equally um, looking at my image on the phone, pointing at myself. I I have that responsibility that I have to tell the horse something. So you tell the horse to usually carry on as we were. So the great example is when we're here in the arena, let's say we're we're going to see, which is over there. I don't know if you can quite see that in the camera. Uh, let's see. <laughs> we're going to see, and let's say something happens, a chicken start having a fight or something, and the horse rears up and, and makes a big old fuss and won't go forward. Everybody immediately starts focusing on the spook, on on crack an egg on its head or whatever the the riders thinking about the spook the instructors thinking about the spook everybody else leaning on the fence is thinking about the spook how is the horse supposed to know that i still mean go to see if everybody's suddenly focusing on this spook and, oh, oh 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 go to see the horse should do as it's told so it's had a little fit uh, it's been surprised by something that's allowed it's allowed guys I mean, if if you're walking through the woods and you suddenly realise that you're just about to step on a snake and you go, oh, that's allowed. But the second you realise that it's just a bit of garden hose that's half half buried in the leaves, can continue with your walk. But you wouldn't then carry that with you as something dreadful that is an implication of bad manners or whatever. So it's allowed and go to see, <laughs> nonetheless. Go to see. Yes, you're allowed to have a jump. Nonetheless, go to see. So how can we tell the horse what we want the horse to do, which will in turn give the horse reassurance, plus our expectation that the horse can still receive instruction? How can we do all that if we get brain freeze? Yeah, are you with me on this? Brain freeze, I... It's a myth. It's not true. It's not true. When you're driving along the November country lanes and your car, the back wheels, hit a bit of, of slidey leaves or something or a bit of mud where the farmers have been doing harvest or whatever and your car skids out, you shit yourself. You still continue to drive the car because you must. You don't get brain freeze. You don't throw your arms around the steering wheel and go, oh, no, I don't like it. Take me home. It doesn't matter that you've had a shock. You still continue to drive the car. Let's put it another way. I have never, no matter how nervous a driver, for example, might be, let's say you got a really scary roundabout. Although people might say, oh, yeah, I get brain freeze in my car as well. No. Because whilst on a horse, you might absolutely freeze, not know what to do, and then decide to get off the horse and go, oh, I can't do this. Nobody's done that in the car, no matter how nervous a, a driver they are. I have never seen, and you have never, I'll do the pointy finger thing again, and you have never seen, you're driving along, and the car in front, the driver can't cope, and so they simply go, I'm getting off this horse, I'm getting out of this car, open the door and just walk out going, I've had brain freeze, and leave the car to coast across the roundabout with the driver's door swinging away into the trap. Never happened. Never happened. You might have a shock and have to go and pull into a lay-by and, and have a little bit of a recover, but it's, you don't. You don't get brain freeze. The only people who do get brain freeze is horse riders. And this is because for the last 30 years and across 20 livery yards and thousands of riders, you've had other horse riders saying, you get brain freeze, don't you? You get brain freeze, don't you? You just get brain freeze. You can't move. You can't do anything. You get brain freeze. You get brain freeze. And yet you don't get brain freeze when you hit the leaves, when, you come, when you're overwhelmed driving. You simply have to get your way out of it. There is no opting out on the scary roundabout or or the skidding leaves or or anything like that and if you don't drive you can apply the same thing to crossing the road or riding a bicycle there is no opting out there is no getting out your car 
and just leaving it to coast across the roundabout with the driver's door swinging and saying, oh, I just got brain freeze, so I got off. None of it. Because there's no opt-out. And the clue's there. When you get brain freeze, you're actually opting out. You're opting out. There we are. The reason why you think it's brain freeze, the reason why you, you get brain freeze is because you've had thousands of riders telling you that you have brain freeze. And so you accept it. It's mass hypnosis, <laughs> not mass. The masses um, constantly say you get brain freeze, don't you? You get brain freeze, don't you? You could be a, a nice young rider coming into, into the, the whole uh, riding scenario, go down your leisure yard, and if it's a particularly nervous yard, you will know that you get brain freeze pretty quickly. But you don't. You opt out. So what we need to do is train ourselves not to opt out, in the same way that we trained ourselves to drive and be able to take hazards and such like oh i think it just broke out then but it seems to be back in i've had it's been stormy and i've had really dodgy internet i couldn't do my Mounted Division Ultimate Rider Confidence course call last night, I, which was really annoying. Um, I meet up with the, the members of that group uh, three times a week, not be able to jump in and get their progress. So let's train ourselves to spooks. That's what we're saying, because so many people simply don't. We'll train ourselves, we'll be training our horse to not spook because we'll be getting it used to things, but we'll also train our own brains to cope with spooks better. And this is how we could do it. If I was to say to you, right, what we're going to do is we're going to set up some spooks in the arena that we can do. So some challenges. Spooks that you set up deliberately are called challenges, but they're still spooks. It's just that you've set them up. So let's say that I've had an idea to set up a challenge for this horse. I'm going to put a garden sprinkler on that fence there behind the camera and it's going to be sprinkling into the arena. I'm going to put another garden sprinkler sprinkling into the arena at C, another garden sprinkler sprinkling into the arena there and a garden sprinkler just sprinkling right on the middle of the arena there. So if I get the horse to do a circle... It's going to go through four different garden sprinklers. I'm going to get on weather gear. Some spooks. Obviously, if the, the horse garden sprinkler, as it comes up to the garden sprinkler, is going to back off. And this is where I can learn to get the horse to go forwards through the garden sprinkler. So you could do that if you uh, would like to go and set that up. That would be marvellous. I can hear you already. Are you mental? My horse would absolutely flip out. Are you mental? But no, I, I, I think you're capable of doing that. If, let me put in an if here, if you give yourself two or three years, I think you could do that. Let's say three years from now. Not this may not next may not next may the may after well suddenly this thing that i've just suggested that seems really impossible uh, suddenly it doesn't seem that impossible if you've got three years to do it in so this is the wonder of bite sizes we've now got the bite sizes we could take so look over here see oh shining into the sun but we've got a little summer house there a little green little green summer house Let's say that we're going to put our first sprinkler in the summer house. We're going to do a lovely, lovely circle. We're going to hit the middle of the arena. We're going to hit the mark there just behind camera where the sprinkler will be in the future. We're going to have a sprinkler at C, so we're going to have to hit that. And as you know, there's no, there's no, when you're doing a circle, no riding along the fence. There's no straight lines in a circle. You get onto the outside track at C and off it at C. So you just take one step onto and off because that's the way a circle is made. And then you take one step onto the outside track there and one step onto the middle 
and keep that circle perfect. Right then. So we're telling the horse, hit the outside track there, right there. Hit the outside track at C. Hit the outside track over there. Hit the middle. Hit that mark. Hit that mark. Hit that mark. Hit that mark. This is the thing. We're telling the horse. We're expecting the horse to do it, and we're telling the horse what to do. We're there. That's it. All we need to do is add in a spook. And when we add in that spook, it's going to be a bite size that we can cope with our own primitive mind and, and um, panic reactions can cope with. It's going to be at a level that the horse can cope with. But we're going to continue to get the horse to do exactly as it's told by giving it a very clear command of us telling it. Yeah, we're going to say what we want. And we're going to make them with our body movement. And we're going to make sure that you hit the mark, hit the mark, hit the mark, hit the mark. At some moment, I'm going to ask my friend to turn on the garden sprinkler. It's going to get on over there. The sun's going to glint at it. It's going to go <laughs> make some noises as it starts up. But basically, the horse is probably not going to be that bothered. Probably one ear will go out and oh, what's that? But it's sufficiently far away that... It's not going to bother me as the rider that the horse is going to freak out. Remember, we are training ourselves. So as my friend goes off to the tap, it's like, right, it's going to start in a minute. Absolutely. I am going to focus a million percent on hit the mark, hit the mark, hit the mark, hit the mark with a laser focus. Hit the mark, hit the mark, hit the mark, hit the mark. Over the next few weeks, that, that sprinkler comes closer and closer. And as the, horse is a, as the horse's attention goes on to it, no, we're already there. We're already saying consistent trot, get your back legs under you, get your top line just so, be on the, be on the bit. Let's have this absolute consistency, nice regular rhythm. Get on, get on, get on, get on, get on. And the horse won't even notice the sprinkler because it will be being told quite clearly hit the mark and that that the horse will find reassuring as well that we know what we're doing if the garden sprinkler was really the garden sprinkler of death if it was really a lion the the horse we we, we wouldn't be schooling the horse we'd be running away the more we can tell the horse to hit the mark, hit the mark, hit the mark, do the circle or the figure eight or whatever the exercise is, the more that can't be as dangerous as the horse might think. Otherwise, we'd be freaking out as well. So over the, the next few weeks, that comes forward and forward and eventually it just starts clipping the fence and maybe we can introduce a second one and you can see how this builds up. By the time we get into the second season, we we just getting a little bit wet on the on the feet, maybe, and you can see how it works. You could build that up until you've got your wet weather gear on. You're flying through these these sprinklers coming into the arena and just driving your horse forward with all the confidence in the world yourself, which your horse will find reassuring. It doesn't want to think for itself whether or not the the sprinkler is dangerous. It wants you to tell it. I said in one of the last videos, wouldn't it be horrible if you got led into a dangerous environment and you had a guide who simply refused to tell you what, how, to, how, to, how to be safe? You just say, oh, you'll make up your own mind. It just wouldn't work. The more you can tell, the more you're going to reassure the horse. Now, you wouldn't be hitting the mark. And, of course, we're not just going to do it with the garden sprinkler. We're going to do it to... Anything we can think of, if you train the horse to everything you can think of, I mean, here we've got flags, ducks, chickens, peacocks, crash mats, tarpaulins, flags, <laughs> sticks, drums, uh, any, any amount of things, loud music. Get it to everything and you train it for anything so as well as doing our, our garden sprinkler we're also going to do flags start off bite sizes start off with a little flag just a, you know just a little little flag you can make it yourself and 
it'll flutter and it'll snap when it's windy or when it's wet or something and, and the horse will get used to it gradually get bigger and bigger over those three years i'm exaggerating three years of course i, I imagine you could depending on the horse i don't know if you own a friesian it might take you three years but anyway depending on the horse <laughs> you could just build this up in whatever time scale suits you and the horse so the flag gets bigger and bigger and eventually you might have seen on shows that you get these flags that are about half the length of this arena great big silky billowing things the horses cantering around pulling it looks absolutely marvelous and by the time you've got a flag like that and you're going around and your horse is quite happily going through the garden sprinklers and you've got a stick and you wrap a little tattoo on the on the fence line just as you go past and hit the mark hit the mark and you get your little cousin jezza to do happy sacks keepy uppies at one corner of the arena or or get in his bmx buddies and do a little display down that end and we're just going to hit the mark do our circles constantly ignoring what's going on get on because if the display of death was indeed a display of death the bicycles of death we would not be schooling our horse. And our horses aren't that stupid. They know that if everything's all right, everything's all right. But you can set it up at the level that you want. Nothing I have said so far has been outrageous if it's taken in the bite sizes. You can have the, the horse leaving of death. That's always good. So you're doing your circle. And I've arranged for my friend who's got their horse to take it out. Now, as soon as the horse goes out, my horse is going to be a little more anxious. Maybe I'm going to be a little more anxious. Remember, I'm training myself as well. And the answer is action beats anxiety. So the action is hit the mark, hit the mark, hit the mark, hit the mark. That's the action. Laser focus. As the horse continues to go further away, my internal dialogue changes to hit the bloody mark, hit the bloody mark, hit the bloody mark, hit the bloody mark. As the horse goes round the corner, my internal dialogue changes again. Hit the, you can put your own adjectives in here until the cows come home. But the point is, focus absolutely on hitting the mark, doing the thing that you want to do. And the spooks and the fears and the anxieties can just go and enjoy themselves somewhere else. People already know this instinctively. You have so many people say, oh, I, I get a distraction. When I feel nervous, I have a distraction. Distraction is an action. It's something to do because action beats anxiety. So let's say that we're going through pheasant country and the thing might spook. Um, or, or we've, even better, let's, let's bite size it down. We're not in pheasant country. Right? Let's, we've arranged a spook in here, which is called a challenge to our level. Um, I don't know, something that you've arranged. Let's say the garden sprinkler is going to go off. And people know that if you want to not feel nervous, then do a distraction. While you're waiting for the garden sprinkler to be turned on, you might feel a little bit anxious yourself and you might be thinking, whoa, I'd better sing Old MacDonald. That'll keep me quiet. Uh, second distraction I could choose is my seven times table. That could keep me quiet. Third distraction I could use is to do the most perfect figure eight with my legs under me just so and my top line just so and my amount on the bit just so and my posture just so and my rhythm just so. The fourth thing I could do is some sort of tapping thing that the NLP people like. Now, of those distractions, which is the best? Singing old MacDonald, doing your seven times table, doing the most perfect figure eight possible or tapping your cheek. Which is, which is the most useful? The thing that you're doing is the distraction that's going to keep you away from anxiety. So by the time you've saved the horse from the feed bag that's pinned to the fence of death and the going over the tarp of death and the going past the obstacle of death and the, the cousin Jezza's 
keep uppies of football of death and the BMX display of death and the flag of death and the drumsticks of death and 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 Uncle Jeff coming out and playing the trombone, Pop Goes Wagner of Death. By the time you've done all those and you go out into the world, if you've trained it for everything you can think of, you've trained it for anything you can think of. So you go out and a bicycle comes past. Now, your horse doesn't know if that bicycle is you've paid Jezza an extra fiver to come past. He doesn't know. I don't even know. Only you know. There we are. That's how to train yourself to your spooks. So by the time you've trained your horse over and over again, that when the thing of death attacks... I have had my life saved over a thousand times by the person on board who knows what they're doing, has got the answer to everything and is in charge. Then your horse will trust you. But more importantly, your own subconscious primitive mind, where all the panic responses and fight and flight lives, that will also have had the experience of over a thousand times when the thing of death happens, best listen to the person on board who knows what they're doing, is in charge, and has this situation under control. And when you think that about yourself, that will be the confidence you need to do spooking. There we are. That's the end of my little spooking lecture. I hope it's been clear. If it's not been clear, stick a question in the comments. Or if you've got a question on something else, pop that into the comments and we can address that next time. So I just want to finish by saying that the Mounted Division Ultimate Rider Confidence course, a three-month course with me, online wherever you are around the world it covers every aspect of the psychology of riding you can read all about it and i believe i've put the link on just below this one i'll be advertising it all this month the may intake is now open if you would like to apply i'll put the link in somewhere around this description and you fill out a little form about your experience and, and you can apply to be part of, of the May intake. And we'll start the next three-month cycle. I hope you enjoy reading about that. I've been whittering on enough. This, I hope so much, will be useful to you because it's worked to the nth, nth, nth degree. Thanks for listening. See you later. Thanks for joining. Don't forget, put your questions, put your comments in the, in the comment section. I will read them and we'll get to them tomorrow. Bye.